Good morning. Welcome to worship this 14th Sunday after Pentecost. Today we praise the Lord for all of the rain that we received last week. Some of the crops are looking better. Of course, the wedding of uh, Mitch and Carissa Fiki yesterday, they did not like all your prayers for rain. During the service, it was raining, and uh, we had a tent, so we were all right, and they are now married, so we celebrate with them, but they would have uh, requested that you put a little specificity into your prayers that it not rained from three to four yesterday, because that was, of course, the wedding itself. This Wednesday, we will have a last summer bash bonfire for the 7th and 12th graders starting at 6 o'clock out back where we'll have a bonfire and some s'more stuff and some games, activities, so that we can have some fun together before confirmation begins again. So invite all of the youth to that. If you're not registered for confirmation, Sunday school, or other fall activities, you can do so now. You can find them on our webpage or in the narthex as you leave today. I know normal is a weird word nowadays, but as we move towards normal, we're going back to that old fall schedule we had two years ago. If you were here, you remember we used to do a 9 o'clock Sunday school hour, adult forum, Bible study, and fellowship hour, and then a 10 o'clock service. Now, I know it's two weeks away, so next week it's still at nine. I'm warning you for two weeks from now, so please make sure you know that two weeks from now, September 12th, is when we start 10 o'clock worship with all the other opportunities at nine o'clock. Our Global Missions Committee is attempting to help us think and pray more for the world by putting regular prayer updates about the church and the people of the world in our bulletin. Today we're praying for our Haitian brothers and sisters. This last week there was an earthquake, earthquake that killed over 1,900 people. There's also a plea for, uh, from LWR, Lutheran World Relief, for funds to help with that disaster. If you've not already started praying for our students and staff of our schools, we are going to start doing that now. May God give the teachers strength for the journey and the students enjoyment in learning. This week is the last week of Bishop John Anderson, who has been the Bishop of Southwestern Minnesota Synod for the last 18 years. So that's my entire ministry. He's been the only bishop. And he is finally getting to retire. We praise God for his ministry and the fact he can go do something else. And so we pray for D. Pedersen, our new bishop, in her six-year term. Helen Peterson passed away yesterday morning Please keep her family in your prayers. We'll have a visitation for Helen this Wednesday night at the funeral home, and her funeral service will be here at 11 o'clock on Thursday. We continue with confession and forgiveness. Please stand as you are able. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Take a moment to confess your sins. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved of people of God, in Jesus the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there's always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Yeah. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you who take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. Let us pray together. O oh God, our strength, without you we are weak and wayward creatures. Protect us from all dangers that attack us from the outside and cleanse us from all evil that arises from within ourselves, that we may preserve through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We invite the children to come forward for a children's message. sun is shining. Can you see out through the windows how the sun is shining? Oh, I love when the winds are so beautiful like that and you can see it. So let's open up and see what's in the box. Oh, and there's a couple of people who are new today. So let's talk about the box. This is the box that we put something in for the children's sermon. But there's some rules. If you bring something, it has to fit in the box, right? Because otherwise it wouldn't be in the box. It can't be food or drink because then we'd spill it or some people might eat it before we got here. So we can't do that. It can't be dangerous to the pastor and it can't be living. And so then we're gonna open this and see. It must be in a container. Oh, you know, even if it's food and drink, I don't want it in a container because then everyone wants no, to eat no, it. No, no, it's living things. You think I should allow living things in here if it's in a, nope, we're not doing living things. There's actually a reason for these rules. And that's because if you put a frog in here, can you imagine what would happen if we shook it and it died? That'd be so sad. Okay, so let's open up and see. Today, oh, what is this? It's a butterfly, that's right. But this is not a living butterfly, is it? No, no, this is a butterfly. Did you make this? Oh, very nice. And how did you know how to make the shape of a butterfly? You don't remember. I think you might have had a little plastic thing shaped like a butterfly. It might have been purple. Do you remember that maybe? Ours is purple. That's why it's purple. Um, so yesterday at the wedding, when it was raining, 
there was a butterfly that was flying around, but it got hit by so much rain that its wings were wet and it flopped to the ground right there in the middle where everyone was walking. Now, is that a good place for a butterfly to be? No. No, what's going to happen? It would step on it and die. Yes, someone might step on it and that would be bad. So I reached down and I picked up the butterfly and I put it up top. Because if butterflies are up top, uh, it was actually on the wheel well of a car that wasn't going to travel for a little while. And the two things about that, one is nobody's going to step on it. And two is if butterflies' wings are wet, they can't fly. But when they dry out, they can now fly again. So I put it up where the wind could dry its wings. And so this is a very beautiful butterfly, I have to say, Gabby. This is wonderful. Yep, you use those little perler beads. And you followed a pattern so it looked very much like a butterfly. And so no one would look at this and think it was in, you know, a, a spider or a tick or a iguana. Everyone said immediately, that's a butterfly. So sometimes the rules are great because they help us to uh, get an identifiable outcome. Today in our first lesson, you'll hear Moses bragging about how good the rules are. He says, isn't it so great we have rules? And we all say to ourselves, wait, what? Who likes rules? How many of you love rules? You go home and you say, I want to read the rules to a new game. I want to go and read the Constitution, see what rules govern the church. How many of you are with me? You are, you are. Oh, some of you are faking. No, none of us do that. Okay, some of us do, but very few. But the rules are important because you had an outline that helped you make this so everyone knew it was a butterfly. We have rules for the box so we don't kill anything in it and so it doesn't harm me when I open it. These rules keep us safe. And so today Moses gives praise to God for all the rules. Now you might not always like the rules you hear. Sometimes you might want to grump at your parents for having rules. But the rules are there so that you can live and be healthy and grow up to be big and strong and have an identifiable and wonderful life. So today we're going to give thanks to God for all God's rules and for our parents who give us rules, okay? So let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for rules that keep us safe and help us to be strong. Thank you for our parents and they put up with us when we grump about the rules. Amen. So who would like the box for next week? I think you guys just had it. Well, you, here we go. I'm giving it to your brother. Those are the rules, Ted. Those are the rules, Ted. Okay, thank you for coming up. Let's head on back. We continue with Psalm 15. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart. Who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath, even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Our first reading today is from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and 6 through 9. So now, Israel, give heed to the statutes and ordinances that I am teaching you to observe, so that you may live to enter and occupy the land of the Lord, the God of your ancestors, is giving you. You must neither add anything to what I command you, nor take away anything from it. But the commandments of the Lord your God 
with which I am charging you. You must observe them diligently, for this will show your wisdom and discernment to the peoples who, when they hear all these statues, will say, Surely this is a great nation, or surely this great nation is a wise and discerning people. For what the other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call him. And what other great nation has statues and ordinances just as the, this entire law that I'm setting before you today? But take care and watch yourselves closely so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen nor let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our second reading today is from James chapter 1, 17 through 27. Glory to you, O Lord. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In fulfillment with his own purpose, he gave us birth by the word of truth so that we would become a kind of first fruits of his creatures. You must understand this, my beloved. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all the sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in the mirror, for they look at themselves and, on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look it into a perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and keep oneself unsustained, unstained by the world. Word of God, word of life. Thank you, God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, and thus observing the tradition of the elders, they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not live according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, the teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandments of God to hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder come from within. Or adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, folly, pride. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Today's gospel goes back to a hygiene debate of the first century. Now that's important to remember here because you might find some similarities to things happening in your lives. But the direct issue here at hand is the cleansing of hands and pots by Pharisees and the Jews. 
Yet as we look at how at that and how Jesus addresses it, we might feel a little bit more about how God wants us to act in the here and now. So what is the issue? What is at stake here? We have the Pharisees on the one hand, and the Pharisees are a very religious group of people who believe that God is active in the world and that all people should set themselves to a very high religious standard. They tend to be more well-off and they have time to rest and think about the ways of God. And in their thinking, they have reasoned that each family was in charge of bringing the religiousness into their own household, which made the Pharisees themselves sort of like priests to their own families. They thought it wasn't just good enough to go to the temple on the required day, right? Like on the Sabbath or on the high holidays. People needed to have a relationship with God in their families. And thus they took the laws very seriously because it was the laws that people would make people behave well and thus all the people of Israel would come to know God through the following of the law. They'd be very quick to point out in our first reading, Deuteronomy 4, for what other great nation has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is whenever we call him? And what other great nation has statues and ordinances as just as this entire law that I'm setting before you today. In fact, the Pharisees would have loved the children's sermon. Yep, laws, that's what we want. We all love more laws. Let's make sure everyone knows their place and it's all orderly. For Moses and the Pharisees, God's love is shown in the law. After all, God cares about their lives so much that God has told them what they can do and what they can't do. And there's certain of us who gravitate towards this way of thinking. So they're not wandering around, stumbling in the dark, but they have direction and they know good and bad. And most of the rabbis at that time agreed that the law was mostly for the protection of your neighbor. Most of the time you make good decisions about yourself, but when it comes to your neighbor, you're like, ah, their importance is not quite as important as me, and so I'll choose a little more what I do and what I don't. The Pharisees have read Exodus 30, 18, where it says... He set a basin between the tents of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing, with which Moses and Aaron and his sons washed their hands and their feet. When they went in the tent of meeting and they approached the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. In other words, when the priests went into God, they would first wash their hands to be clean. And so the Pharisees said, well, if you're going before God, you need to wash your hands. And so if I'm going before God, let's say before I pray for a meal or after I do my business, making sure I'm clean, that's a great thing. So let's just make sure that everyone washes all the time. After all, why not be safer than sorry? You might as well follow the rule too much than not enough. Yet that's not the rule in Exodus. The rule in Exodus is a very specific way of making the priests wash before entering the temple, so at a very specific time. Yet the Pharisees have reasoned it out and thought, if it's good then, it must be better to do whenever you go before God. And don't, doesn't that kind of appeal to us? I mean, I think we can all answer that we probably like hand washing. We think it's a good thing. In fact, if you're like me, you like people to wash their hands more than not. But from a religious perspective, the Pharisees, you can kind of see how it's born of the law, but it's more than the law. It's not just following the law, it's the law and then some. Even though it might be a good idea to wash more often, like before meals, it's not a requirement by the law. So that's the Pharisees and what they have at stake. They're like, if you guys are following God, you need to wash more often because that's what we do and we're following God and we're getting closer to God through it. On the other hand, you have the disciples who are not from Jerusalem, that place of great learning and ideas. They, for the most part, are not from well-off families. They tend to be poorer and have more blue-collar jobs like fishermen. They don't do things like wash their hands before meals because, well, it's not a thing in their world. Sure, if you're a fisherman, you wash your hands all the time, right? Every time he gets to the water, you wash your hands, but you're not going to carry on the boat a bronze pot so you can wash your hands before you eat lunch, right? That's just not a thing that it would spill off. You've got water everywhere. Why would you do such a thing? 
Now, the disciples are not especially dirty people. If they have dirt on their hands, they'll wipe it off. But as hardworking as they are, they're very active and they don't have time to study the law and get specialized training in how to wash their hands. They figure God doesn't really care if a farmer who's in the field all day has a basin of water out there at lunchtime. You know, they say, just make sure your food doesn't like, taste like dirt and you'll be okay, right? After all, that's what we need. When Moses and the disciples were wandering around in the wilderness, they didn't have time to put special water out for washing. They were traveling in the wilderness. And so why should we have to do it now if God didn't command it? And so these two thoughts and these two worldviews collide. And there is some tension. Now, we don't get the whole story here. We only get the end when the Pharisees and scribes are complaining to Jesus and telling him that right now he needs to get his disciples to do it the right way because otherwise his disciples won't be loved by God, and that's not good, they need that. But I doubt it started there. So I like to imagine how it might have started, right? And the Bible doesn't record, so this is all from my imagination, but it's probably something like this. After all, the Pharisees were intrigued by Jesus. The Pharisees were this renewal movement. Take God seriously. We have to go be out there and making sure we're talking about God, doing things about God, and that's exactly what Jesus did right? And Jesus was teaching and preaching, and the Pharisees, for the most part, liked it. In fact, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, goes to Jesus and say, you're clearly from God, so let's talk about it. Let's see how you're from God, because I don't understand it all. And so these two groups had similar interests, and there seems to be some curiosity, and I can imagine one of the Pharisees going like, yeah, let's do lunch sometime, right? Let's just talk this out, see if we're of the same mind. And so they get together and all the Pharisees line up to wash their hands because that's, after all, what a good Pharisee does. And all the disciples just dig in. Awkward, right? All of a sudden, the uh, Pharisees are scandalized and a bit disgusted. And the disciples are embarrassed and a little defensive. And there's one in every crowd, so one of the Pharisees probably went, <coughs> bumpkins, <coughs> sorry, sorry, cough. And the disciples now get a little offensive, like, what are you talking about, you guys? <laughs> you guys are germaphobes. How can eating a little dirt hurt you? It puts hair on your chest. Yes, I know germ theory was not invented until the year 1000, but it's my imagination. And if Peter wants to say germaphobe in my imagination, he can, right? You can imagine it escalating from there. Not at those exact words, but then all of a sudden going back and forth and getting more set and set in their arguments. Pretty soon the disciples are talking about how those people are uptight and don't trust God to keep them clean. Meanwhile, the Pharisees are talking about the savages who eat their own filth. So where does it end? The Pharisees decide to go over their head. They go, Jesus, Jesus, fix this for us. Command all your disciples to be good, decent, civilized, God-fearing people. They say, why do your disciples not live according to the traditions of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Now, hopefully you hear that question, which was reasonable from the Pharisees' point of view, has become overbearing, claiming religious and moral authority that it doesn't have but it does by the time it reaches Jesus. It is not just, well, we're all priests, so they should probably wash their hands before our meals. It is now an indignant, how can they eat with defiled hands? Jesus rejects the, questions, the question. He tells them that he's more concerned, they're more concerned with the outward actions of a person than with the well-being of the person, with their spiritual health or with their physical health. In fact, he rebukes the Pharisees and tells them that they're abandoning and co-opting the laws of God and making what they deem to be best into the laws of God himself and trying to make their will God's will. And this is in spite of them being right. History and germ theory will prove them correct. It is better to wash your hands at various points during the day. Not because God loves you more if you do, but you're more likely you're less likely to spread disease and less likely to get disease if you wash your hands. Yet Jesus doesn't explain germ theory to them, and this is the third time I've said germ theory, so let me just explain germ theory. Germ theory is the theory that germs cause diseases. Before that, we had a different theory. That was germs showed up when there was disease. It's sort of like 
Flies always around a cow pie, right? But nobody says, I bet that fly made the cow pie. That's what we thought germs were. They just kind of showed up in happenstance, like, oh, you've got a disease. Those germs show up because you're weak. No, we say now germs cause disease, which is why hand washing is a good idea. Jesus doesn't teach them that, although he could have. Instead, Jesus takes this moment to get them to recognize that the evil we do is not born from outside of us, not by washing our hands, but from the inside. We are not these perfect little beings that the world corrupts and makes evil. We have plenty of evil intentions right there inside of us. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All of those are already inside you whether you wash your hands or not. And we need to look inward and work to confess them and to become better people and become closer to God. And when we do that, we can invite others to join us and draw closer to God rather than policing what other people do. We can care about why they do it and their own health and say to them something like, we find it very helpful spiritually if you wash your hands before meals because it reminds you of God and let the other person then choose one way or the other. James, Jesus' brother, speaks clearly today. He says, let everyone be quick to listen, but slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. The Pharisees were right on the hand washing, but they were wrong when it came to the best idea and made it into a purity test to see if God would love and accept people. The Pharisees need to listen to the disciples more about where they stood and then be able to tell them why it was better to wash in my mind, the bib, not biblical here, but in my mind, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees and then says, you know, Peter, you could wash a little better sometimes, right? That dirt is, you know, you could just wash it. Now, that was all about first century cleanliness practices. So let's talk about today. Today, there's another public health divide, and it carries a large risk to the population and the world as a whole. Many people argue that it's not a risk for them and depending on your person your health status it might not be but remember i was a biologist by primary training in college and what i have read leads me to for the sake of the neighbor to be vaccinated it has also as delta spread lead me to carry around a mask at all times and check in with people if i don't know their concern or their status and go do you want me to wear a mask and if they do, great. If they don't, well, I don't, as I'm not up here. But I check in with people and hear what they're saying. I believe this is the right course of action, and I do wish others would do the same, because the risks of COVID are real and ever-changing, which is why I think over the next year this will bear out again and again. As a, but as a biologist, I, I also have to say I've been surprised many times by this pandemic, and so what I know so confidently today might prove to be wrong. And so I keep listening as we learn more about COVID and the vaccines. But, we are, but as we continue to live in this reality, it's important that we do not make God's love or the value of people become tied up with the actions they take. Because I've read from both sides some awful demonizing articles that show the other side as stupid or less than human, and even once celebrating when people on the other side have something bad happen to them, they say smugly, see, they deserved it, they earned it, and besides, if they're not gonna do it, what do they expect? I've read from both sides Facebook posts that are hateful. We, start, we are starting to make what we think about this issue affect whether or not they are fully human. I believe we need to hearken back to James. Let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. So many times now, instead of worrying about the other person's health, we're worried about their outward action. We really need to listen to each other, slow to speak, slow to condemn, and when we speak, speak with boldness and love. We need to not divide into camps and hate each other but realize that God loves all of humanity and is drawing us together here in this space. We need to be together and we need to be as wise as serpents and as innocents and doves. But we also need to be clear about God's love for all people 
and to be Christ-like, listening to each other and trying to love them to change as Christ the Lord didn't yell at you until you were good enough, but rather loved you, showed his love through word and deed so that you might know his grace and follow him. Let this be our prayer. Let this be what we commit ourselves to so that God may use this time for healing. Amen. Please stand for the hymn of the day. our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended in heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. We pray for the church that is a safe haven for all who seek your presence. Fill it with pastors, deacons, and leaders who echo your expansive and generous welcome. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the whole of creation, the plants and animals that have habitats and resources to thrive and flourish. Inspire us to protect threatened habitats and ensure a sustainable future for generations to come. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven, we pray for comfort for the families of those whose loved ones were lost. And remember to pray for the thousands of others who are injured or displaced from their homes because of the Haitian earthquake. We pray for the Haitian government during this ongoing crisis that they would see to safe passage for relief workers and the clearance of roadways so that supplies can reach those in need. We ask for safety and guidance for the leaders and volunteers who are directly helping the people of Haiti. May they be encouraged and strengthened as they minister to others in this time of great need. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all who are in need, especially Hazel, Marilyn, Ginny, Pastor Heidi, Bruce, Nora, Toby, Elsie, Myrtle, Wilma, Elaine, Shirley, Ardell, Kara and Todd, 
support and encourage them and restore them to health. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for this congregation, especially those beginning a new school year. Empower teachers and school administrators, guide students in their learning and development, accompany parents, foster parents, and caregivers, provide encouragement and love. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We give thanks to the faithful departed who show us how to honor God with our heart, especially Helen. Inspire us by their example and renew our faith, trusting that we will be united with them in glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated as we give our offerings now to the Lord. stand. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on a desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you, for your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-given love. For your word of life, O God, we give you thanks and praise. 
Send your spirit of truth, O God. Rekindle your gifts within us. Renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as they forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Live as the body of Christ. We will.